it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Haunter of the Ring As I entered John Kirwan's study, I was too much engrossed in my own thoughts to notice, at first, the haggard appearance of his visitor, a big, handsome young fellow well known to me. Hello, Kirwan, I greeted. Hello, Gordon. I haven't seen you for quite a while. How's Evelyn? And before he could answer, still on the crest of the enthusiasm which had brought me there, I exclaimed, Look here, you fellows. I've got something that will make you stare. I got it from that robber Ahmed Mektub, and I paid high for it, but it's worth it. Look. From under my coat I drew the jewel-hilted Afghan dagger which had fascinated me as a collector of rare weapons. Kirwan, familiar with my passion, showed only polite interest, but the effect on Gordon was shocking. With a strangled cry, he sprang up and backward, knocking the chair clattering to the floor. Fists clenched and countenance livid, he faced me, crying, Get back! Get away from me, or... I was frozen in my tracks. What in the... I began bewilderedly, when Gordon, with another amazing change of attitude, dropped into a chair and sank his head in his hands. I saw his heavy shoulders quiver. I stared helplessly from him to Kirwan, who seemed equally dumbfounded. Is he drunk? I asked. Kirwan shook his head, and, filling a brandy glass, offered it to the man. Gordon looked up with haggard eyes, seized the drink, and gulped it down like a man half famished. Then he straightened up and looked at us shamefacedly. Oh, I'm sorry I went off my handle, O'Donnell, he said. It was the unexpected shock of you drawing that knife. Well, I retorted with some disgust. I suppose you thought I was going to stab you with it. Yes, I did. And then, at the utterly blank expression on my face, he added, Oh, I didn't actually think that, at least. I didn't reach that conclusion by any process of reasoning. It was just the blind, primitive instinct of a hunted man, against whom anyone's hand may be turned. His strange words and the despairing way he said them sent a queer shiver of nameless apprehension down my spine. What are you talking about? I demanded uneasily. Hunted? For what? You never committed a crime in your life. Not in this life, perhaps, he muttered. What do you mean? What if retribution for a black crime committed in a previous life were hounding me? He muttered. <laughs> That's nonsense, I snorted. Oh, is it? He exclaimed, stung. Did you ever hear of my great-grandfather, Sir Richard Gordon of Argyll? Sure, but what's he got to do with it? You've seen his portrait. Doesn't it resemble me? Well, yes, I admitted. Except that your expression is frank and wholesome, whereas his is crafty and cruel. Uh, he murdered his wife, answered Gordon. Suppose the theory of reincarnation were true. Why shouldn't a man suffer in one life for a crime committed in another? You mean, you think you're the reincarnation of your great-grandfather? Oh, of all the fantastic... Well, since he killed his wife, I suppose you'll be expecting Evelyn to murder you. This last was delivered in searing sarcasm, as I thought of the sweet, gentle girl Gordon had married. His answer stunned me. My wife... He said slowly, has tried to kill me three times in the past week. Well, there was no reply to that. I glanced helplessly at John Kirwan. He sat in his customary position, chin resting on his strong, slim hands. His white face was immobile, but his dark eyes gleamed with interest. In the silence I had a clock ticking like a death watch. Tell us the full story, Gordon suggested Kirwan, and his calm, even voice was like a knife that cut a strangling, relieving the unreal tension. You know I've been married less than a year, Gordon began, plunging into the tale as though he were bursting for utterance. His words stumbled and tripped over one another. 
Oh, all couples have spats, of course. But we've never had any real quarrels. Evelyn is the best-natured girl in the world. Oh, the first thing out of the ordinary occurred about a week ago. We'd driven up into the mountains, left the car, and were wandering around, picking wildflowers. Well, at last we came to a steep slope, some thirty feet in height, and Evelyn drew my attention to the flowers which grew thickly at the foot. Well, I was looking over the edge and wondering if I'd climb down without tearing my clothes to ribbons, when I felt a violent shove from behind me that toppled me over. Well, if it had been a sheer cliff, I'd have broken my neck. As it was, I went tumbling down, rolling and sliding, and brought up at the bottom scratched and bruised, with my garments in rags. I looked up and saw Evelyn staring down, apparently frightened half out of her wits. "'Oh, Jim!' she cried. "'Are you hurt? How came you to fall?' Well, it was on the tip of my tongue to tell her that there was such a thing as carrying a joke too far, but these words checked me. I decided she must have stumbled against me unintentionally, and naturally didn't know it was she who had precipitated me down the slope. Yeah, so I laughed it off and went home. Oh, she made a great fuss over me, insisted on swabbing my scratches with iodine, and lectured me for my carelessness. I hadn't the heart to tell her it was her fault. But four days later, the next thing happened. I was walking along our driveway when I saw her coming up in the automobile. I stepped out on the grass to let her by, as there isn't any curb along the driveway. She was smiling as she approached me and slowed down the car as if to speak to me. Then, just before she reached me, a most horrible change came over her expression. Without warning, the car leaped at me like a living thing as she drove her foot down on the accelerator. Only a frantic leap backward saved me from being ground under the wheels. The car shot across the lawn and crashed into a tree. I ran to it and found Evelyn dazed and hysterical, but unhurt. Well, she babbled of losing control of the machine. I carried her into the house and sent for Dr. Donnelly. He found nothing seriously wrong with her and attributed her dazed condition to fright and shock. Within half an hour she'd regained her normal senses, but she's refused to touch the wheel since. Strange to say, she seemed less frightened on her own account than on mine. She seemed vaguely to know that she'd nearly run me down, and grew hysterical again when she spoke of it. Yet she seemed to take it for granted that I knew the machine had got out of her control. But I distinctly saw her wrench the wheel around, and I know she deliberately tried to hit me. Why, God alone knows. But still, I refused to let my mind follow the channel it was getting into. Evelyn had never given any evidence of any psychological weakness or nerves. She's always been a level-headed girl, wholesome and natural. But I began to think she was subject to crazy impulses. Yeah, most of us have the impulse to leap from tall buildings, and sometimes a person feels a blind, childish, and utterly reasonless urge to harm someone. We pick up a pistol, and the thought suddenly enters our mind how easy it would be to send our friend, who sits smiling and unaware, into eternity with the touch of a trigger. Well, of course, we don't do it, but the impulse is there. So I thought perhaps some lack of mental discipline made Evelyn susceptible to these unguided impulses and unable to control them. Oh, nonsense, I broke in. I've known her since she was a baby. If she has any such trait, she's developed it since she married you. Well, it was an unfortunate remark. Gordon caught it up with a despairing gleam in his eyes. Well, that's just it. Since she married me, it's a curse. A black, ghastly curse, crawling like a serpent out of the past. I tell you, I was Richard Gordon, and she... She was Lady Elizabeth, his murdered wife. His voice sank to a blood-freezing whisper. I shuddered. Oh, it's an awful thing to look upon the ruin of a keen, clean brain, and such I was certain that I surveyed in James Gordon. Why or how, or by what grisly chance it had come about, I could not say. But I was certain the man was mad. You spoke of three attempts. It was John Kirwan's voice again, calm and stable amid the gathering webs of horror and unreality. <laughs> look here! 
Gordon lifted his arm, drew back the sleeve and displayed a bandage, the cryptic significance of which was intolerable. I came into the bathroom this morning looking for my razor, he said. I found Evelyn just on the point of using my best shaving implement for some feminine purpose, to cut out a pattern or something. Well, like many women, she can't seem to realize the difference between a razor and a butcher knife or a pair of shears. Well, I was a bit irritated and said, Evelyn, how many times have I told you not to use my razors for such things? Bring it here, I'll give you my pocket knife. Well, I'm sorry, Jim, she said. I didn't know it would hurt the razor. Here it is. She was advancing, holding the open razor toward me. I reached for it, and then something warned me. It was the same look in her eyes just as I'd seen it the day she nearly ran over me. That was all that saved my life, for I instinctively threw my hand up just as she slashed at my throat with all her power. The blade gashed my arm, as you see, before I caught her wrist. For an instant she fought like a wild thing. Her slender body was taut as steel beneath my hands. And then she went limp, and the look in her eyes was replaced by a strange, dazed expression, and the razor slipped out of her fingers. I let go of her, and she stood swaying as if about to faint. I went to the lavatory. My wound was bleeding in a beastly fashion. And the next thing, I heard her cry out, and she was hovering over me. Jim, she cried. How did you cut yourself so terribly? Gordon shook his head and sighed heavily. I guess I was a bit out of my head. Oh, my self-control snapped. Oh, don't keep up this pretense, Evelyn, I said. God knows what's got into you, but you know as well as I that you've tried to kill me three times in the past week. Well, she recoiled as if I'd struck her, catching at her breast and staring at me as if at a ghost. She didn't say a word. And just what I said, I don't remember, but when I finished, I left her standing there white and still as a marble statue. I got my arm bandaged at a drugstore and came over here not knowing what else to do. Kirwan, O'Donnell, it's damnable. Either my wife is subject to fits of insanity. He choked on that word. No, no, I can't believe it. Ordinarily her eyes are too clear and level, too utterly sane, but every time she has an opportunity to harm me, she seems to become a temporary maniac. He beat his fists together in his impotence and agony. But it isn't insanity. I used to work on a psychopathic ward, and I've seen every form of mental unbalance. My wife is not insane. Then what? I began, but he turned his haggard eyes on me. Only one alternative remains, he answered. It's the old curse. From the days when I wore the earth, with a heart as black as hell's darkest pits, and did evil in the sight of man and of God. She knows. In fleeting snatches of memory, people have seen before, have glimpsed forbidden things in momentary liftings of the veil, which bars life from life. She was Elizabeth Douglas, the ill-fated bride of Richard Gordon, whom he murdered in jealous frenzy, and the vengeance is hers. I shall die by her hands, as it was meant to be. And she... He bowed his head in his hands. Just a moment... It was Kirowan again. You've mentioned a strange look in your wife's eyes. What sort of a look? Was it of maniacal frenzy? Gordon shook his head. It was utter blackness. All the life and intelligence simply vanished, leaving her eyes dark wells of emptiness. Kirowan nodded and asked a seemingly irrelevant question. Have you any enemies? Not that I know of. Oh, you forget Joseph Rolock, I said. I can't imagine that elegant sophisticate going to the trouble of doing you any actual harm, but I have an idea that if he could discomfort you without any physical effort on his part, he'd do it with a right good will. Kirwan turned on me an eye that had suddenly become piercing. And uh, who is this Joseph Rolock? A young exquisite who came into Evelyn's life and nearly rushed her off her feet for a while. But in the end, she came back to her first love, Gordon here. Rolock took it pretty hard. 
For all his suaveness, there's a streak of violence and passion in the man that might have cropped out, but for his infernal indolence and blasé indifference. Oh, there's nothing to be said against Rolla, interrupted Gordon impatiently. He must know that Evelyn never really loved him. He merely fascinated her temporarily with his romantic Latin air. Well, not exactly Latin, Jim, I protested. Rolog does look foreign, but it isn't Latin. It's almost Oriental. Well, what has Rolock got to do with this matter? Gordon snarled with the irascibility of frayed nerves. He's been as friendly as a man could have been since Evelyn and I were married. In fact, only a week ago he sent her a ring, which he said was a peace offering and a belated wedding gift. Said that, after all, her jailing him was a greater misfortune for her than it was for him. Oh, that conceited jackass. A ring. Kirwan suddenly came to life. It was as if something hard and steely had been sounded in him. What sort of ring? Oh, a fantastic thing. Copper. Made like a scaly snake coil three times, with its tail in its mouth and yellow jewels for eyes. I gather he picked it up somewhere in Hungary. And as he travelled a great deal in Hungary. Gordon looked surprised at this questioning, but answered. Why, apparently the man's travelled everywhere. I put him down as the pampered son of a millionaire. Yeah, he never did any work, so far as I know. Well, he's a great student, I put in. I've been up to his apartment several times, and I never saw such a collection of books. Gordon leaped to his feet with an oath. Are we all crazy? he cried. I came here hoping to get some help. You fellows fall to talking of Joseph Rolock. I'll go to Dr. Donnelly. Wait. Kirwan stretched out a detaining hand. If you don't mind, we'll go over to your house. I'd like to talk to your wife. Gordon dumbly acquiesced. Harried and haunted by grisly forebodings, he knew not which way to turn, and welcomed anything that promised aid. We drove over in his car, and scarcely a word was spoken on the way. Gordon was sunk in moody ruminations, and Kirawan had withdrawn himself into some strange, aloof domain of thought beyond my ken. He sat like a statue, his dark, vital eyes staring into space, not blankly, but as one who looks with understanding into some far realm. Though I counted the man as my best friend, I knew but little of his past. He had come into my life as abruptly and unannounced as Joseph Rolock had come into the life of Evelyn Ash. I'd met him at the Wanderers Club, which is composed of the drift of the world, travellers, eccentrics, and all manner of men whose paths lie outside the beaten tracks of life. I'd been attracted to him, and intrigued by his strange powers and deep knowledge. I vaguely knew that he was the black sheep younger son of a titled Irish family, and that he had walked many strange ways. Gordon's mention of Hungary struck a chord in my memory. One phase of his life Kirawan had once let drop fragmentarily. I only knew that he'd once suffered a bitter grief and a savage wrong, and that it had been in Hungary, but the nature of the episode I did not know. At Gordon's house, Evelyn met us calmly, showing inner agitation only by the over-restraint of her manner. I saw the beseeching look she stole at her husband. She was a slender, soft-spoken girl, whose dark eyes were always vibrant and alight with emotion. That child tried to murder her adored husband. <laughs> the idea was monstrous. Again, I was convinced that James Corden himself was deranged. Following Kirawan's lead, we made a pretense of small talk, as if we'd casually dropped in, but I felt that Evelyn was not deceived. Our conversation rang false and hollow, and presently Kirawan said, Mrs. Gordon, that is a remarkable ring you're wearing. Do you mind if I look at it? Oh, I'll have to give you my hand, she laughed. I've been trying to get it off today, but it won't come off. She held out her slim white hand for Kirawan's inspection, and his face was immobile as he looked at the metal snake that coiled about her slim finger. He did not touch it. I myself was aware of an unaccountable repulsion. There was almost something obscene about that dull, copperish reptile that was wound around the girl's white finger. It's evil-looking, isn't it? She involuntarily shivered. 
Well, at first I liked it, but now I can hardly bear to look at it. Oh, if I can get it off, I intend to return it to Joseph, uh, Mr. Rowlock. Kirawan was about to make some reply when the doorbell rang. Gordon jumped as if shot, and Evelyn rose quickly. I'll answer it, Jim. I know who it is. She returned an instant later with two more mutual friends, those inseparable cronies, Dr. Donnelly, whose burly body, jovial manner, and booming voice were combined with as keen a brain as any of that in the profession, and Bill Bain, elderly, lean, wiry, and acidly witty. Both were old friends of the Ash family. Dr. Donnelly had ushered Evelyn into the world, and Bain was always Uncle Bill to her. Howdy, Jim. Howdy, Mr. Kirwan, roared Donnelly. Hey, O'Donnell, you got any firearms with you? <laughs> Last time you nearly blew my head off showing me an old flint dog pistol that wasn't supposed to be loaded. Dr. Donnelly. We all turned. Evelyn was standing beside a wide table, holding it as if for support. Her face was white. Our badinage ceased instantly. A sudden tension was in the air. Dr. Donnelly she repeated, holding her voice steady by an effort. I sent for you and Uncle Bill, for the same reason for which I know Jim has brought Mr. Kirwai and Michael. There's a matter Jim and I can no longer deal with alone. There is something between us, something black and ghastly and terrible. What are you talking about, girl? All the levity was gone from Donnelly's great voice. But my husband, she choked, then blindly went on. My husband has accused me of trying to murder him. The silence that fell was broken by Bane's sudden and energetic rise. His eyes blazed and his fists quivered. Oh, you young pup, he shouted at Gordon. I'll knock the living daylight. Ah, sit down, Bill. Donnelly's huge hand crushed his smaller companion back into his chair. No use going off half cock. Go ahead, honey. We need help. We cannot carry this thing alone. A shadow crossed her comely face. This morning Jim's arm was badly cut. He said I did it. I don't know. I was handing him the razor. Then I must have fainted. At least, well, everything faded away. When I came to myself, he was washing his arm in the lavatory, and, and he accused me of trying to kill him. Why? The young fool, about the belligerent Bane. Hasn't he sense enough to know that if you did cut him, it was an accident? Ah, oh, shut up, won't you? snorted Donnelly. Honey, now, did you say you fainted? Well, that isn't like you. Well, I've been having fainting spells, she answered. First time was when we were in the mountains and Jim fell down a cliff. We were standing on the edge, then everything went black and... When my sight cleared, he was rolling down the slope. She shuddered at the recollection. And then when I lost control of the car and crashed it into the tree, you remember, Jim called you over. Dr. Donnelly nodded his head ponderously. I don't remember you ever having fainting spells before. Jim says I pushed him over the cliff. She cried hysterically. He says I tried to run him down in the car. He says I purposely slashed him with a razor. Dr. Donnelly turned perplexedly toward the wretched Gordon. How about it, son? God help me, Gordon burst out in agony. It's true. Why, you lion hound. It was Bane who gave time, leaping again to his feet. If you want a divorce, why don't you get it in a decent way instead of resorting to these despicable tactics? Damn you, roared Gordon lunging up and losing control of himself completely. If you say that, I'll tear your jugular out. Evelyn screamed. Donnelly grabbed Bane ponderously and banged him back into his chair with no overly gentle touch. Kirwan laid a hand lightly on Gordon's shoulder. The man seemed to crumple into himself. He sank back into his chair and held out his hands gropingly towards his wife. Evelyn, he said, his voice thick with laboring emotion. You know I love you. I feel like a dog, but God help me, it's true. If we go on this way, I'll be a dead man and you... Don't say it, 
she screamed. I know you wouldn't lie to me, Jim. If you say I tried to kill you, I know I did, but I swear, Jim, I didn't do it consciously. God, I must be going mad. That's why my dreams have been so wild and terrifying lately. Of what have you dreamed, Mrs. Gordon? asked Kirawan gently. She pressed her hands to her temples and stared dully at him, as if only half comprehended. A, um, a black thing, she muttered. A horrible, faceless black thing that mows and mumbles and pours over me with apish hands. I dream of it every night, and in the daytime I try to kill the only man I ever loved. I'm going mad. Maybe I'm crazy already and I don't know it. Oh, calm yourself, honey. To Dr. Donnelly, with all his science, it was only another case of feminine hysteria. His matter-of-fact voice seemed to soothe her, and she sighed and drew a weary hand through her damn locks. We'll talk all this over and everything's going to be okay, he said, drawing a thick cigar from his vest pocket. Ah, give me a match, honey. She began mechanically to feel about the table, and just as mechanically Gordon said, There are matches in the drawer, Evelyn. She opened the drawer and began groping it, when suddenly, as if struck by recollection and intuition, Gordon sprang up, white-faced, and shouted, No, oh, no, don't open that drawer, don't... Even as he voiced that urgent cry, she stiffened, as if at the feel of something in the drawer. Her change of expression held us all frozen, even Kirawan. The vital intelligence vanished from her eyes like a blown-out flame, and into them came the look Gordon had described as blank. The term was descriptive. Her beautiful eyes were dark wells of emptiness, as if the soul had been withdrawn from behind them. Her hand came out of the drawer holding a pistol, and she fired point-blank. Gordon reeled with a groan and went down, blood starting from his head. For a flashing instant she looked down stupidly at the smoking gun in her hand, like one suddenly waking from a nightmare. Then her wild scream of agony smote our ears. Oh God, I've killed him. Jim, Jim! She reached him before any of us, throwing herself on her knees and cradling his body, head in her arms, while she sobbed in an unbearable passion of horror and anguish. The emptiness was gone from her eyes. They were alive and dilated with grief and terror. I was making toward my prostrate friend with Donnelly and Bane, but Kirawan caught my arm. His face was no longer immobile. His eyes glittered with a controlled savagery. Leave him to them, he snarled. We are hunters, not healers. Lead me to the house of Joseph Rolong. I didn't question him. We drove there in Gordon's car. I had the wheel, and something about the grim face of my companion caused me to hurl the machine recklessly through the traffic. I had the sensation of being part of a tragic drama which was hurtling with headlong speed towards a terrible climax. I wrenched the car to a grinding halt at the curb before the building where Rolock lived in a bizarre apartment high above the city. The very elevator that shot us skyward seemed imbued with something of Kirawan's driving urge for haste. I pointed out Rolog's door, and he cast it open without knocking and shouldered his way in. I was close at his heels. Rolog, in a dressing gown of Chinese silk work with dragons, was lounging on a divan, puffing quickly at a cigarette. He sat up, overturning a wine glass which stood with a half-filled bottle at his elbow. Before Kiran could speak, I burst out with our news. James Gordon has been shot. He sprang to his feet. Shot? When? When did she kill him? She? I glared in bewilderment. How did you know? With a steely hand, Kiran thrust me aside. And as the men faced each other, I saw recognition flare up in Rolock's face. They made a strong contrast. Kirawan, tall, pale, with some white-hot passion. Rolok, slim, darkly handsome, with the Saracenic arch of his slim brows above his black eyes. I realized that whatever else occurred, 
It lay between these two men. They were not strangers. I could sense like a tangible thing the hate that lay between them. John Kirawa, softly whispered Rollo. Ah, you remember me, Yosef Rollo. Only an iron control kept Kirawan's voice steady. The other merely stared at him without speaking. Years ago, said Kirawan more deliberately, when we delved in the dark mysteries together in Budapest, I saw whither you were drifting. I drew back. I would not descend to the foul depths of forbidden occultism and diabolism to which you sank. And because I would not, you despise me, and you robbed me of the only woman I ever loved. You turned her against me by means of your vile arts, and then you degraded and debauched her, sank her into your own foul slime. Oh, had I killed you with my own hands then, Josef Frollo. Vampire by nature, as well as by name, that you are. But your arse protected you from physical vengeance. But you trapped yourself at last. Kirouan's voice rose in fierce exultation. All his cultured restraint had been swept away from him, leaving a primitive, elemental man raging and gloating over a hated foe. You sought the destruction of James Gordon and his wife, because she unwittingly escaped your snare. You. Rowlock shrugged his shoulders and laughed. You are mad. I have not seen the Gordons for weeks. Why blame me for their family troubles? Kirwan snarled. Liar as always. What did you say just now when O'Donnell told you Gordon had been shot? When did she kill him? You were expecting to hear that the girl had killed her husband. Your psychic powers had told you that a climax was close at hand. You were nervously awaiting news of the success of your devilish scheme. But I did not need a slip of your tongue to recognize your handiwork. I knew as soon as I saw the ring on Evelyn Gordon's finger. The ring she could not remove. The ancient and accursed ring of Thoth Amon. Handed down by foul cults of sorcerers since the days of forgotten Stikia. I knew that ring was yours, and I knew by what ghastly rights you came to possess it, and I knew its power. Once she put it on her finger, in her innocence and ignorance, she was in your power. By your black magic, you summoned the black elemental spirit, the haunter of the ring, out of the gulfs of night and the ages. Here in your accursed chamber, you performed unspeakable rituals to drive Evelyn Gordon's soul from her body and to cause that body to be possessed by that godless sprite from outside the human universe. She was too clean and wholesome, her love for her husband too strong for the fiend to gain complete and permanent possession of her body. Only for brief instants could it drive her own spirit into the void and animate her form. But that was enough for your purpose. But you have brought ruin upon yourself by your vengeance. Kirouan's voice rose to a feline screech. What was the price demanded by the fiend you drew from the pits? <laughs> you blench. Josef Frolok is not the only man to have learned forbidden secrets. Mm, after I left Hungary, a broken man, I took up again the study of the black arts to trap you, you cringing serpent. Yeah, I explored the ruins of Zimbabwe, the lost mountains of Inner Mongolia, and the forgotten jungle islands of the Southern Sea. I learned what sickened my soul, so that I forswore occultism forever. But I learned of the black spirit that deals death by the hand of a beloved one, and it is controlled by a master of magic. But, Josef Frolok, you are not an adept. You have not the power to control the fiend you have invoked, and you have sold your soul. The Hungarian tore at his collar as if it were a strangling noose. His face had changed, as if a mask had dropped away. He looked much older. You lie, he panted. I did not promise him my soul. I do not lie. Kirouan's shriek was shocking in its wild exultation. I know the price a man must pay for calling forth the nameless shape that roams the gulfs of darkness. Look. 
There, in the corner behind you, a nameless, sightless thing is laughing, is mocking you. It has fulfilled its bargain, and now it's come for you, Josef Frolok. No, no, shrieked Frolok, tearing his limp collar away from his sweating throat. His composure had crumpled, and his demoralization was sickening to see. I tell you, it was not my soul. I promised it a soul, but not my soul. He must take the soul of the girl, or of James Gordon. <laughs> Fool, roared Kirwan. Do you think he could take the souls of innocence? And he would not know that they were beyond his reach. The girl and the youth he could kill. Their souls were not his to take or yours to give. But your black soul is not beyond his reach, and he will have his wage. Look, he's materializing behind you. He's growing out of thin air. Was it the hypnosis inspired by Kiruan's burning words that caused me to shudder and grow cold, to feel an icy chill that was not of earth pervade the room? Was it a trick of light and shadow that seemed to produce the effect of a black anthropomorphic shadow on the wall behind the Hungarian? No. By heaven, it grew, it swelled. Vrolok had not turned. He stared at Kirwan with eyes starting from his head, hair standing stiffly on his scalp, sweat dripping from his livid face. And Kirwan's cry started shudders down my spine. Look behind you, fool. I see him. He has come. He is here. His grisly mouth gapes in awful laughter, his misshapen paws reaching for you. And then, at last, Vrolok wheeled with an awful shriek, throwing his arms above his head in a gesture of wild despair. And for one brain-shattering instant, it was blotted out by a great black shadow. Kirwan grasped my arm and we fled from that accursed chamber, blind with horror. The same paper, which bore a brief item telling of James Gordon having suffered a slight scalp wound by the accidental discharge of a pistol in his home, headlined the sudden death of Joseph Rolock, wealthy and eccentric clubman, in his sumptuous apartments, apparently from heart failing. I read it at breakfast, while I drank cup after cup of black coffee, from a hand that was not too steady even after the lapse of a night. Across the table from me, Kirwan likewise seemed to lack appetite. He brooded as if he roamed again through bygone years. Hmm, Gordon's fantastic theory of reincarnation was wild, though, I said at last. But the actual facts were still more incredible. Tell me, Kirwan, was that last scene the result of hypnosis? Was it the power of your words that made me seem to see some black horror grow out of the air and rip Josef Rolok's soul from his living body? He shook his head. No human hypnotism would strike that black-hearted devil dead on the floor. No, there are beings outside the ken of common humanity, foul shapes of transcosmic evil. Such a one it was with which Vrolok dealt. But how could it claim his soul? I persisted. If indeed such an awful bargain had been struck, it had not fulfilled its part. But James Gordon was not dead, but merely knocked senseless. Vrolok didn't know it, answered Kirwan. He thought that Gordon was dead, and I convinced him that he himself had been trapped and was doomed. In his demoralization, he fell easy prey to the thing he called forth. It, of course, was always watching for a moment of weakness on his part. The powers of darkness never deal fairly with human beings. He who traffics with them is always cheated in the end. It's a mad nightmare, I muttered. But it seems to me, then, that you, as much as anything else, brought about Vrolok's death. Hmm, it is gratifying to think so, Kirwan answered. Evelyn Gordon is safe now, and it is a small repayment for what he did to another girl years ago in a far country.
Well, I'll tell you one thing. Those bloody vampires, they get everywhere, don't they? You can't trust them. Don't turn your back on them. They'll be in there like a shot. Really, they will. Well, another fantastic old-school piece of horror there from Robert E. Howard. I did one of his stories on Monday last week, and it went down really well. Um, people clamouring for more, so who am I to deny you, my dear friends? I try and give you exactly what you want every time. <laughs> sometimes I fail, sometimes I do. Something that doesn't please everyone, but I try my best, and you know that. Well, that is your Sunday evening entertainment from me for this week. Um, give me some ideas what you want next week on Sunday. Uh, I've been doing some serials, got a few of them out of the way. Still a few left to um, resolve, round up, and finish off, but I'll get there eventually. But, well, oh, something big coming up tomorrow. Not quite sure what yet, but... You know, we do like to spend Monday evenings together, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> Back again very soon, my dear friends. You enjoy your Sunday evenings, everyone, okay? See you tomorrow night. Till then, very, very sweet dreams. And bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.